conference, all participants' lines are on a listen-only mode until the question and answer session. At that time, if you have a question, press star 1. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. It is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Carl Yonder. Thank you, sir. You may begin. Thank you for joining us for the Workforce Grand Rounds webinar series, The Power of Resiliency, Unlocking the Quadruple AIM webinar. Today's presentation, today's combined presentation, can be downloaded by clicking on the files located in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. When the file is highlighted, click the Download Files button. You'll then be able to save the file in a location of your choice. At the conclusion of all of today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. You'll be able to do so uh, over the phone and through the chat pod. To ask questions over the phone, please dial in using the phone number and participant code located in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. If you hear an echo, please mute your computer speakers. If you're in listen-only mode, the operator, um, to ask a question over the chat pod, you can uh, do so by typing in your question, and the chat pod is located underneath today's presentation. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. We hope that you find the webinar incredibly helpful. I'll now turn the presentation over to Tara Spencer. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for joining our webinar. This webinar series is a part of our Nurses Week events here at HRSA, and we would just like to take the opportunity to thank you for taking the time to join this webinar. Our agenda for today, um, we will start with our purpose and objectives of the webinar, a BHW or Bureau of Health Workforce Overview, connecting the quadruple aim, followed by our presentations, question and answer session, and then ending with poll questions. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide resources for building a resilient health workforce to meet the demands of a dynamic healthcare landscape. During this webinar, we will illustrate risk factors that impact workforce effectiveness and resilience in rural and underserved areas, highlight professional organizations and their strategies for increasing resiliency among the health professionals and trainees, and feature a successful resilience initiative among HRSA award recipients. With more than 40 workforce programs, it's important to set overarching goals to guide our work. As we look to the future, we have identified four, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I apologize. The Health, Bureau of Health Workforce has a vision and mission that is guided towards education, training, and service. Our vision is for education to training to service, BHW will make a positive and sustained impact on healthcare delivery from underserved communities. Our mission is to improve the health of underserved and vulnerable populations by strengthening the health workforce and connecting skilled professionals to communities in need. The BHW priorities are to transform the healthcare workforce by creating training opportunities, incentives, and sustained support for clinicians working in rural and underserved areas. We also have a priority to increase access to behavioral health services, including substance use disorder treatment. We also have a priority to leveraging healthcare workforce data to inform program and policy. And we would like to infuse BHW values and priorities across the organization to guide decision making. These are our BHW core values, and we strive to reflect these values in all of the work that we do. These values in addition to the priorities that I mentioned before, guide our approach as we create programs and funding opportunities. Ultimately, BHW works to create a well-distributed and robust workforce supply of diverse, culturally competent health professionals who provide quality health care to communities in need. BHW provides diverse funding opportunities, more than 40 total. Our programs focus on expanding community-based training to expand access to care in underserved communities. In academic year 2017-18, BHW programs supported by Title VIII and Title VII provided training to over 435,000 future and current health care providers. The Nurse Corps is one of our programs. The strength of our Nurse Corps program, um, they focus on helping to alleviate the critical shortage, shortage of nurses in high needed areas across the U.S. and its territory. Currently, there are over 1,800 nurses who are providing care to those that most need it. The Nurse Corps program provides care to more than 1.9 patients a year. 
BHW also has a focus on nursing as one of its health professions. We support programs that improve nursing education, practice, retention, and faculty development, behavioral and public health education, and practice. We offer opportunities to underserved and rural communities new and more efficient models of care. In FY18, BHW's nursing workforce development programs that are funded by Title VIII were appropriated $227.9 million. Our public health programs work towards improving health of communities by making important investments in public health students. BHW facilitates over 2,000 continuing education courses at 10 regional public health training centers for current and future public health workforce professionals. We supported over 300 students practicing at 190 sites, serving medically underserved areas from 2014 to 2018. BHW has also been able to train over 600,000 professionals from 2014 to 2018. BHW programs help to address the need for integrated behavioral health care in primary care settings. In academic year 2017-2018, BHW helped to train more than 6,000 new behavioral health providers. According to the 2015 National Impact Assessment of Quality Measures Report released by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, or CMS, shows that the delivery system transformation across the country has made progress towards achieving the triple aim to achieve better health care for patients, better health for our communities, and lower costs through improvement for our health care system. All of our programs in BHW are working toward continuing to support programs and initiatives that continue to move in that direction. Because we are the bureau that supports the health workforce, we have to acknowledge the clinician's role in transforming health care. This critical role has been catalyst for the healthcare industry to move towards adopting the quadruple aim, which adds the goal of improving the experiences of the healthcare providers. The speakers that you will hear from today will focus on how we can move forward achieving the quadruple aim from the many different aspects of nursing research, national initiatives, and practice, and how that builds resiliency not only in the nursing profession, but to the healthcare workforce as a whole. I will now turn it over to Lieutenant Commander Leslie Poudrier, who will introduce our speakers for today. Our first speaker is Dr. Allison Ross. Dr. Ross is a nurse scientist with Nursing Research and Translational Science at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center. She graduated from Vanderbilt University with a BSN and MSN in Psychiatric Mental Health Nursing. Dr. Ross received a PhD from the University of Maryland School of Nursing in May of 2012. She was awarded a pre-doctoral intramural research training fellowship in 2011 at the NIH Clinical Center, where she completed a postdoctoral fellowship in 2014. Dr. Ross's nursing experience includes pediatrics, women's health, and mental health. In addition to her experience, her nursing experience, she received a certificate in health coaching from Georgetown University. Her current research at the NIH focuses, focuses on stress and coping in family and professional caregivers, including the nursing staff at the NIH. She has researched, published, and presented widely on the importance of health-promoting behaviors, such as proper nutrition, physical activity, social support, and stress reduction activities, and alleviating the stress associated with caregiving. Dr. Ross, I'd like to turn the presentation over to you. Thank you. So as Leslie pointed out, my research has focused on um, stress and coping in caregivers. And we, I don't need to tell you that um, nursing is a stressful profession. There is a lot of evidence that shows that this is true. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for nurses to experience stress. Among those are unfavorable work schedules, things like um, long hours, so hour, uh, out shifts in excess of 10 to 12 hours, um, variable or rotating shifts, um, lack of control over schedules, um, and shift work in general is stressful to any employee because you don't, um, 
you don't get to finish and start projects as you would in a typical job, um, and the work never ends. But probably the primary reason that nursing is stressful is that it's a job in which there are high demands and very low control. A scientist by the name of Robert Kurosek in the 70s and 80s really uh, looked at job stress and its impact on health. And what he found was that, indeed, jobs that are particularly have high demands and low control create the most job, stress, job strain or stress and lead to cardiovascular disease and other health problems, including obesity. Um, this is really well documented and has been well researched for a number of decades. And um, towards the later end of the 80s, they started adding social support to the model. So in addition to demands and control, social support was found to be um, a big factor in the equation. And the way that it works is that jobs that are low demand, high control, and lead to high levels of job strain are made worse if there is low social support within the workplace um, or where individual workers feel isolated. But in in the same scenario where there is high levels of social support, the workers are protected against the risk of cardiovascular disease and some of these health out, out, um, aspects. This research has shown to be um, uh, the same in nurses. And over the last decade or so, the, um, the topic of loneliness and social isolation has received a great deal of research attention. In fact, loneliness is considered the new smoking. Um, and when I'm talking about loneliness, there's, I'm talking about both loneliness and social isolation. So social, social isolation is being alone, so being isolated from others. Um, and that could be because you live in a rural setting or maybe you're working in research in Antarctica. Um, but interestingly, if you look at um, all of the research on both loneliness and social social isolation, both loneliness and social isolation increase morbidity and all-cause mortality. It's a direct linear relationship. And it really doesn't matter whether you are truly socially isolated or whether you just perceive yourself as being, as being isolated and alone and lonely. And indeed, there isn't, it's surprisingly um, a low correlation between loneliness and actual so social isolation. So you can be surrounded by people and still feel very lonely. Um, and if you think about it, isolation is actually a form of torture. Human beings are social animals. We're hardwired to connect to others and seek that support and comfort of the group. And solitary confinement is a way of torturing people. They've done it in war. They do it in prisons. Um, and it works. Now, on a more positive note, today's webinar is about resilience in nursing. And um, if you look at factors that are associated with resilience in nursing, social support um, is one of the most important. This slide is a composite of a lot of research that has been done specifically in nurses as it relates to social support. And what you'll find is that there are two main um, areas that have been researched related to uh, social support. And one is bullying, and the other is workplace social support. So bullying is the persistent, systematic victimization of a target with repeated negative acts over a long period of time to the extent that the target struggles to defend him or herself. This is sometimes referred to as horizontal violence, although it doesn't have to be horizontal nurse-to-nurse -nurse or peer-to-peer -peer bullying. There's also bullying, um, evidence of bullying um, from supervisors, from managers, from doctors, also from patients. And there has been a great deal, a disturbing amount of research that's been done on the topic of bullying. Um, and there's really good evidence that um, regarding the factors that, are, that contribute to bullying, including certain, certain job characteristics, 
Um, in other words, stressful work environments contribute to bullying. Um, institutional upheaval. So when, you, when there's a lot of change in an institution, there tends to be more bullying. Um, also work overload um, is associated with bullying. Poor interpersonal relationships contribute to it, and those things include interpersonal conflicts, the presence of cliques or alliances, and then the culture of an organization, a poor culture, will um, lead to bullying. Uh, for example, when you have laissez-faire leadership, um, when there is, uh, you have tolerance or even rewarding of the bullying by um, bystanders and by supervisors. And it's, it's fairly clear, any, bullying can happen to anyone, um, but the most at risk tend to be new nurses. Those are um, new graduates and then nurses who are new to the, whatever the work environment is. And um, it's not altogether clear why that is, but probably these people are at the bottom of a power hierarchy. I do want to say that um, if you read the literature on bullying, it's rooted in oppression theory, and there are quite a few papers on this topic. And oppression theory basically says that um, when you have oppressed groups, which there are, um, there are authors who argue that nursing can be an oppressed profession, um, that there is infighting within oppressed groups, and it actually does relieve frustration of the person who's doing um, the bullying. And so you tend to see it in those environments. Um, on the flip side, there's been a little less research, but still a good amount of research that looks at workplace social support um, for nursing. And here we find that positive job characteristics, things like um, uh, self-scheduling, self-governance, um, structural and psychological empowerment all contribute to social support. Um, higher quality relationships, those where, where you have higher emotional intelligence among the nursing staff, a sense of group cohesion, a sense of community, um, and a culture that is intolerant of bullying, one that is civil and um, socially just, you tend to see uh, more social support in the workplace. Authentic leaders who use psychological um, empowerment um, also contribute to social support. And the downstream effects of bullying um, are pretty well known and negative. Those include psychological um, problems, including anxiety and depression and stress cognitive problems, insomnia, poor physical health, there's increased absenteeism and higher job turnover and lower job satisfaction. Now on the flip side, if you look at social support, um, you'll see that um, there's good evidence in nurses that social support leads to higher job satisfaction, um, better physical outcomes, reduced secondary traumatic stress, that's the stress that is associated with caring for very sick patients, um, is reduced by social support in the workplace. Um, and there's also evidence that shows that nurses who have higher social support um, find it easier to lose weight, um, and they have lower levels of obesity. Um, now, this is interesting because obesity is a real problem in nursing. We have levels of overweight and obesity that are at least equal to or sometimes even greater than in the general population. And there's very good evidence um, in the form of the Whitehall studies in England that workplace stress, there's a direct dose relationship between stress and obesity in a workforce. And, um, and I've actually written some about this, but I do believe that it's, it's the stress of the nursing workplace that's contributing to obesity in nurses, um, and that all the physical activity and proper nutrition might not be able to mitigate the effects of stress um, on nurses trying to lose weight. So I'll give a little bit of information on those resources later, if you're interested. Um, I do want to point out that when I'm talking about social support in the workplace, I'm talking about um, not just emotional support, which is what you typically think of when um, you think of social support, but so friends in the workplace. But I'm also talking about instrumental support. And this is support like providing information and help. 
So in other words, stepping in if someone needs to take a break and covering for their patients, or providing information to new nurses on how to operate equipment or how the, how the, uh, how the unit works. Um, those, both types of support are important to improving outcomes um, in nurses. And my area of interest has been in, um, in building resilience through health promoting behaviors, through improving health promoting behaviors. And by this I refer to um, exercise, proper nutrition, and stress management. And what we know is that loneliness um, and the flip, social support, directly impacts one's health, um, physical and mental health. But there are indirect, um, indirect, there's an indirect relationship between um, social support and health in that individuals who receive social support are not only healthier, but they're also more likely to engage in health-promoting behaviors. So they're more likely to exercise. They're more likely to eat better. They're more likely to go out and take a yoga class and practice stress management. Now, there are lots of reasons for these, and I've gotten into it in some of my um, articles. But um, my mo one of my most recent studies um, where I looked at factors that influence nurses' participation in health-promoting behaviors um, and these results are published in the Journal of Nursing Management um, and most recently in Advances of Nursing Science, we looked at those factors that influence nurses' participation in those behaviors. And what we found is that there are lots of barriers to nurses taking care of themselves. Um, and some of them are not surprising at all. The nurses say they don't have any time, they're working long hours, um, they're saying there's not access to gyms or um, showering facilities or maybe not a refrigerator and microwave so that they can warm up healthy food at work. Um, fatigue and lack of sleep was actually the number one barrier to them um, participating in health-promoting behaviors. They say that they're just completely exhausted by the end of the day. Um, another barrier was outside commitment, so lots of nurses have children. They're going to school. They might be taking care of an elderly family member. All those things are just one more time um, demand on their time. Um, and the final barrier to them, one of the barriers that they identified was that there's this unhealthy culture at work. So there's an unhealthy food culture whereby we tend to celebrate everything with food, <laughs> much of it unhealthy, and that there's some pressure to participate and eat these things. Um, there's also this, um, an unhealthy culture whereby we, um, we tend to really emulate um, people suffering. So if someone says they work a 12-hour shift and didn't take a break or use the bathroom or eat lunch, we, we, they kind of wear that with a badge of honor. And if people try to take care of themselves, they often are looked down upon as being selfish or maybe not, um, that it's, it's, uh, it's not really being a real nurse. Um, so two themes that emerged from this latest study, though, that were particularly surprising were the impact that an influence that their peers at work, that other nurses had over nurse, nurses' participation in health-promoting behaviors. And here, the, um, the nurses um, reported that their peers and supervisors could either be supportive or they could be unsupportive, and they could be positive as well as negative role models. And here are just a few of the um, quotes that we, um, exemplar quotes from that study, and for those who aren't watching or looking at this online, I'll read some. So the nurses said, um, other nurses will stress me with their attitudes. It's hard to leave the floor. I'd like to walk the stairs or sit outside for lunch but feel guilty asking for that time. Um, another said, I would love to go running at work during my break times, but then it is looked upon poorly as though you're not doing your job. Um, other nurses were talking about, they say, if I see others eating unhealthy food, I feel less guilty about doing it myself. A lot of them talked about that, kind of the fact that they um, 
it's just easier. And there's actually really good research that shows um, that it's true that the norms surrounding food, that if you're around people who are eating or encouraging eating unhealthy food, then you're more likely to um, be overweight and obese. The take home point of all this is that the kindness and support that we extend to our peers in the workplace can have a direct effect on our mood and our health by reducing loneliness and isolation. But there can be indirect effects of providing support or not providing support on, um, on our health by how it influences our choices regarding self-care. So this was a very brief overview of looking at the importance of so workplace social support. Um, there are, um, there's a lot of research out there on, on um, bullying, a little bit less, but still some research on social support that shows that, um, but most of those are descriptive studies that look at um, kind of who is being bullied and what are the outcomes associated with bullying and social support. Um, some intervention studies have been done, and in some interventions and institutional programs appear to help increase social support. Things like preceptorships, mentorships, um, nurse residency programs for new, new nurses, particularly those with mentors who are trained to facilitate communication, um, and those that include trainings, things like cognitive rehearsal for handling workplace conflict. But education alone doesn't appear to be effective, and interventions designed to just improve uh, interventions to design to improve factors like emotional intelligence and social justice really haven't been done or are not well examined. If you're interested in this topic, I included um, I included three articles that I've written. Two are research studies and one is a review. The review is um, an in-depth review that I published in 2018 in the AORN journal. It should be on the reference list. And there I go into much more detail about um, those things that contribute to nurses not participating in health promoting behaviors and um, factors that contribute to obesity in nurses. And that is it for me today until we have questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ross, for a very informational presentation. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Jamie Murphy Dawson is the Director of Program Operations for the Healthy Nurse, Healthy Nation Grand Challenge and Innovation at the American Nurses Association. Her past programmatic work at ANA has included occupational safety and health topics such as safe patient handling and mobility, violence prevention, and sharp safety. She attended George Washington University School of Public Health and Health Services and earned a Master's of Public Health degree with a focus on environmental and occupational health. Jamie, I'm turning over the presentation to you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone, and, and happy Nurses Week. So I, I love to start with the Code of Ethics because that's always a good place to start. And Provision 5 of the Code of Ethics states that the nurse owes the same duty to self as to others. And this provision goes on to say that nurses should model and maintain health promotion measures that they teach and avoid unnecessary risks to health and safety. And this also recognizes that compassion fatigue and fatigue affect a nurse's professional performance and personal life. And to really mitigate these effects, nurses should eat a healthy diet, exercise, get enough rest, maintain family and personal relationships, engage in adequate leisure and recreational activities, and attend to spiritual and religious needs. And this goes on to say that nurse leaders have the responsibility to really foster this balance within their organization. So I, I know that's, that's a lot, uh, but really what this is saying is that there are factors, personally and professionally, that make it harder for nurses to be healthy. And as such, we need to recognize that, and nurses need to be even more mindful and more intentional about taking care of their health. And of course, there's a very important role of employers of nurses um, that we'll talk about more. So we know that the health of nurses is critical because, first of all, one in 84 Americans is a registered nurse. So that's a really big population in and of itself. So if we could improve the health of nurses, we would be improving the health of 4 million Americans. 
Uh, but it goes, it goes beyond that because we really see a trickle effect. Nurses, when healthy themselves, are perceived as more credible sources of health information. They're, more, they're, they're perceived as role models if they themselves exhibit those healthy behaviors and are therefore more likely to go that extra step in educating and advocating for patients. And of course, it goes even further than that because nurses are members of their community. They serve on state, local, national boards. Nurses volunteer in schools and churches. And, and really, nurses are everywhere. It's a powerful community. And um, you all have the ability to, to influence health on a big scale. Unfortunately, though, we know that the health of nurses is suffering, and I'm, I'm so pleased to follow Dr. Ross because uh, she, she laid out the, the foundation of this um, really beautifully. We know that almost every indicator of health besides smoking, nurses are less healthy than the average American. So nurses are more likely to be overweight and obese, sleep less, struggle more to get those five or more servings of daily fruits and vegetables, and are more than twice as stressed as the average American in the workplace. Here at ANA, we've gathered data for about 20 years on the, the health, safety, and wellness of nurses. We have, are currently looking at a data set with about 20,000 survey responses. And we're seeing some, some positive trends. So nurses are reporting that they feel safer at work. They have more access to programming like safe patient handling and mobility and um, sharps injury prevention programs. Nurses are even saying that they feel more valued and respected by both their employers and patients. Uh, the the not-so-good news, though, is that nurses continually, continually uh, report feeling stressed in the workplace. About about 25% say that they have workloads that feel unmanageable day to day. About a quarter are reporting coming early and staying late. About half are working through breaks and feel as though they must work when they're sick and injured. So I'm really excited to tell you today about the Healthy Nurse Healthy Nation Grant Challenge. Uh, we took on this, this national initiative about two years ago to really focus on these issues and to elevate the importance of nurses achieving the self-care that they need to be as effective as they can and to really um, achieve health and, and achieve that trickle effect that I mentioned when it comes to improving the health of their patients and community. Our vision here is that by improving the health of the, that is to improve the health of the nation by first improving the health of nurses. And this is really a grand challenge and that is this big, bold, audacious goal to address this, this deep problem. And the way that we're tackling it is by engaging nurses on multiple levels. So we want to provide resources and support for nurses uh, so that they can assess their own health and take action. We also want to connect nurses with each other and with organizations that represent them, where they're employed, uh, to really get that support that they need to improve their health. And we're focused on five areas, physical activity, rest, nutrition, quality of life, and safety. Now, the first three here are, are really important in any health and wellness initiative. Of course, there are factors that, that make all three of these uh, a little bit more challenging for nurses. And the last two we, we added really uh, specifically for the nursing population because we know that stress does impact quality of life and that there are a lot of factors in the work environment that can, that can affect safety as well. So, so far we have about 90,000 nurses participating and 475 organizations in every state. And those include schools of nursing, employers of nurses, uh, state and specialty nursing associations, and also other healthcare organizations and, and companies who have an interest in improving the health of nurses. I want to tell you a little bit about our, our, the experience when somebody joins Healthy Nurse Healthy Nation. And first want to add that 
that this is free and available to all. So, of, of course, we welcome nurses, we welcome nursing students, we welcome other healthcare professionals, and even friends and family of nurses who are interested in participating. So this is a look inside of a platform we, call, we have called Healthy Nurse Connect. And once you join, you'll have an opportunity to fill out your profile and to add a picture, to, to talk about, you know, add a bio, to connect with, with any organizations you're interested in and any individual nurses. And then you'll see a dashboard that really announces uh, some of our upcoming activities. One thing we do that's designed to be fun and engaging are our health challenges. So once or twice a month, we have 10-day challenges where you can get one actionable tip sent to your phone or to your email. And the idea here is that these are, are simple tips that are evidence-based that can help you slowly build towards healthier habits. Uh, for instance, we have a, a sugar reduction challenge where we start with contemplation, really taking a close look at how many grams of sugar you're eating in a day. And then we, we send you a tip every day to help you take small steps towards that healthier habit. Our next challenge, which will start next week, is a, a fruits and veggie challenge. And we found in our Healthy Nurse survey that 14% of nurses are getting those five or more daily servings of fruits and vegetables. That's something we really want to work on, and, and, and we'd love for all of you to, to join us on Monday. Another important piece of our platform is the Healthy Nurse Survey. So some of the data points I shared with you a moment ago are from this survey. And this is a comprehensive assessment of the health, safety, and wellness of nurses. And really looks at everything from distracted driving to, you know, did you, did you get your, your flu shot? Um, how many servings of whole grains are you getting? Uh, it's it's uh, up to 99 questions and takes about 13 to 15 minutes to complete. So after taking the survey, you get this interactive heat map that shows your health risks in green, yellow, and red. And you can click on any of these boxes to get your response compared to the ideal response. Click through to the resources um, that are uh, associated with those, those different topics. You'll also get your Healthy Nurse Index score, and that's a quick snapshot out of 10 that gives you, gives you a picture an idea of, of your health. What we plan to do uh, is reset this survey periodically so that you can go back in. Hopefully you've participated, engaged in, in some of our activities, and then you'll be able to see how you improve over time. We have weekly uh, newsletters that go out. So they go out every other week, one week to our partners, one week to individuals participating. And, a, and an important piece of these, these newsletters uh, is spotlighting. So we tell the stories of our partners and individuals who, who have joined. Um, the stories are designed to be engaging and to really kind of break down what did this individual do, what did this nurse do, what did this organization do to really see success and, and, and make a difference in the health of nurses. We have um, an annual report that goes out every year. And this annual report, again, really brings some of those stories to life, uh, shares some of our data. Now, um, one of the things, the ways that we partner with our organizations is we ask them to, to make a specific and measurable commitment towards improving the health of nurses. And this is where the role of employers of nurses is especially important because it's the employers of nurses that have that responsibility and that ability to create that culture of safety and those opportunities for nurses to achieve self-care during the day. So we share a lot of stories about organizations who do things like create restoration rooms or um, remove sugar sweetened beverages from cafeterias or have step challenges or are working to improve um, or to improve safe patient handling mobility in organizations so what we want to do through healthy nurse healthy nation is to really magnify those efforts to talk about them over and over and over again so that others can get inspiration and, and take action I want to end with a few recommended resources. So as part of the, the Healthy Nurse platform, you'll get those exemplars. 
There's also a resource library that links to, to our white papers here at ANA, but also other resources from our partners. Um, we also highlight the, the um, call to action on moral resilience. And this was from a professional issues panel that ANA convened a couple of years ago to deliver policies and strengthen moral resilience within nurses. This call to action document pictured here outlines um, these issues and addresses moral distress. So also within this document, look for the Promising Practices Toolkit that features practices from, countries, from, from um, organizations around the country that are aimed to strengthen clinicians' moral resilience. And then I have a link here to the National Academy of Medicine Collaborative. And this is a multi-year initiative that's focused on better understanding the challenges of clinician well-being and promoting evidence-based and, and multidisciplinary solutions to address burnout. And I want to... Uh, to point you towards the Clinician Wellbeing Knowledge Hub, too, because this is a beautifully done resource where you can search and, and get all sorts of um, evidence-based resources to address burnout. Here is a quote from one of our, our participants of Healthy Nurse Healthy Nation. This is Janelle from Baltimore. And, and we love this because it really does speak to a lot of the issues that we hear day in and day out from nurses, that there's there's this guilt, this inherent guilt that a lot of nurses feel when it comes to taking care of themselves. And this just the focus back to the importance of self-care and how self-care, it isn't indulgent. It is extremely important and allows nurses to provide the best care that they can. Here are my references that you can take a look at. And here's uh, two ways that you can join. So you can sign up at hnhn.org, um, and you can get our, our tips there. You can also text Healthy Nurse to 52866. If you're interested in being an organizational partner rather than participating as an individual, you'll see information there. And one of the things that we do for our partners is we um, provide them with um, aggregated, de-identified data reports so that they can track progress at the organizational level, too. So, so please get in touch if you'd like more information on that. And we really hope you, hope you join the movement. And thanks again for having me, and happy National Nurses Week. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Our last speaker for today is Allison Avesakura, and she is the Vice President for Training and Programs at the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved, also known as ACU. In her role, she is responsible for all of ACU's programs, trainings, and education curricula. Allison serves as the Director of the STAR-2 Center, a federally funded national cooperative agreement with the Bureau of Primary Healthcare at HRSA. Allison is a national expert in clinical workforce design and strategy and has worked to improve access to care for underserved populations for almost a decade. She began her career building a statewide workforce program at the Pennsylvania Association of Community Health Centers and then served as a program manager for the Primary Care Association and Health Center Controlled Network Department at the National Association of Community Health Centers. She received her Master's of Arts from the University of Maryland College Park and has a Bachelor's of Arts from Lebanon Valley College in Anvil, Pennsylvania. Thank you, Allison. Thank you all. Hey, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, uh, wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks to the team at Bureau of Health Workforce for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here with you during Nurses Week. It is always difficult to be the last in a lineup of such knowledgeable and impressive speakers, but I'm going to keep it snappy. Uh, hopefully we'll have a great time before the ever exciting Q&A. I hope you will feel free uh, to chat away as we're going with any questions, thoughts, feelings, etc. I am Allison Avisacra, the VP of Training and Programs here at the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved. Uh, for those of you who aren't in our network, I can tell you that we're a national nonprofit really focused on two goals, access to care and primary care clinician support. So we're really workforce people. We are focused on the recruitment and retention of a transdisciplinary team sort of solving the access issue. We do a large number of things on the topics you see here and more. Um, but really the reason I'm here is through one of our pro programs, uh, the 
HRSA's Bureau of Primary Health Care supports 20 national organizations through what they call a national cooperative agreement. So if you don't know what that is, uh, no worry, you're not alone, but please Google it after we're done. There's a group of 20 of us. Um, oh, and you can also go to healthcenterinfo.org for more information, and I'll put that in the chat box later. Um, but we're a group of 20 who are funded by Bureau of Primary Health Care to support uh, health centers in all that they need to do to provide excellent care to patients. There are two of those national cooperative agreements that are focused exclusively on workforce issues. One is Community Health Center, Inc. I see we have Amanda Shizzle on the line, so if you have questions for them, she can be with you in the chat box. Um, they focus on health professions trainings and team-based care with their NCA, and then we receive one for clinician recruitment and retention. We call our project the STAR Center, Solutions Training and Assistance for Recruitment and Retention. Uh, chcworkforce.org is the name of that. It's in the bottom of all my slides, and we'll put that in the chat box as well. Um, but uh, that is all things, uh, resources, training, and technical assistance, recruitment and retention, and of course, burnout and resilience is part of that. Um, it's free for you, for everyone, because of the support of the Bureau of Primary Health Care. So we thank them for their support, and we're happy to talk with you about anything you might want once you start thinking about doing a deeper dive into some of this resilience work we're talking about. Um, I could talk about the STAR Center all day, but I better not because we're here for a reason, uh, and we're really talking about how we can do something to get to that quadruple aim. So our previous speakers talked a lot about what individuals can do, the hurdles they face, things they can try, and uh, luckily Jamie kind of transitioned us into the role of employers. Our work is really about what organizations can do and what levers they have to make a change in this resilience work. Um, it's really important to understand that, yes, the employers and the organizations, both the cultures and a lot of the structures there, uh, do have a big impact on their teams, on their nurses, on their entire staff. So I have to say that we're big believers that a plan is the real way to make impactful change at your organizations. And uh, I am a reformed English major, so I have to linger just one moment on the language element of that, which is what really is a plan that we're talking about. So just for today's discussion, as you're thinking about all the ideas I'm going to throw at you, I want you to think about uh, the difference between a strategy and a plan. So for what we're talking about today, a strategy is a specific process with some identified metrics, and a plan is a structure that m links multiple strategies together. So you want to think about how your organizations can use multiple strategies together to create that plan to address the components of resiliency and burnout that you're thinking about that you think might have the highest impact at your organizations. Uh, the IHI has a great framework for improving joy in workplace, and it kind of goes like this. One, ask staff what matters to you. Two, identify unique impediments to joy in work. Three, commit to a systems approach. That's where we're getting to the plan part. Commit to a systems approach to making joy in work a shared responsibility at all levels of the organization. And four, use improvement science to test approaches to improving joy in work in your organization. So that's the strategy piece. So you can see how all of those strategies kind of link together. Uh, I find in general people hate the word plan. They think it means something that you have in a huge binder that sits on a shelf and only gets pulled down when someone wants to come to a, a visit to your organization and get you in trouble. But a plan is really just a structure to understand what you're doing. It's going to help you track what works, track what doesn't work, use data to do some innovative stuff. Uh, and really you should wor use the word that works for you, whether it's a plan or a playbook or you know that Excel spreadsheet on Sam computer, whatever it, it you want to call it, it just needs to be written down, regularly evaluated, and connected to larger organizational benchmarks. And that last piece is the real thing where we want to say, yes, everybody um, has a role and opportunity to identify how self-care is not an extravagance, that developing resilience is part of their work. But we also need to recognize the other part of it, which is to say our organizations really need to be committed to pulling what levers they do have to allow individuals the opportunity to put those pieces into practice. 
Okay, now that we're on the same page about needing a plan, the question really becomes what kind of strategies you should put into that plan. Uh, so we know that burnout in our work and in our lives is really about a constellation of factors coming together to overwhelm us. And like with all complex problems, it can feel like efforts that are focused only on one star in that constellation are a bit hollow or don't really get you where you need to go. So we th think you should start with a plan that's kind of a collection of strategies that helps you address a number of factors uh, and really what your organizations can do to support nurses and all members of the team. There's a whole universe of factors out there that you could choose. We're going to focus on five high-impact areas that should definitely be included in your plans in some way, shape, or form. It's physical space where people work, support provided to your teams, the support your organization provides to individuals, administrative processes, and internal communication. So for each of these five buckets, you can have a series of strategies, free, expensive, somewhere in the middle, whatever works for your organization, but just saying, hey, we really want to work this year on um, addressing the burnout implications of all, all of our administrative processes that, that are in our clinical teams at this one site. That would be a good example of a, how having a plan can keep you going. Okay, so physical space. Obviously, how you set up your organization can have a definite impact on the satisfaction and engagement of team members. So think about all the types of work that your teams do, and think about whether your physical spaces help them do uh, all of the types of stuff that our previous speakers have hit on. You know, when staff staff need to do all different types of work, nurses especially, sometimes they're alone, sometimes they're working on charts, sometimes they're uh, collaborating. So when they need to do all these different things, you know, are the spaces working for them? When they need to focus, maybe they need to work and be working on a, a laptop for a while, is there a place to get some uninterrupted work done? Maybe they've just had a really challenging patient and need just five minutes to use their meditation app in a quiet, you know, semi-dark space to just recenter. Is there a place for them to do that? When your teams need to collaborate, are there enough workspaces all together where they have some space to actually work on things and they don't need to w walk back and forth and um, they really get to connect in with each other? When they need to meet as a group, are there options for them to meet kind of in privately, sort of in back-facing ways and also front-facing ways when they want patients or other folks to see them collaborating? There's a lot here to do. A lot of the physical space stuff can mean larger plans, but I don't want you to think like, oh, now we have to reconfigure our entire uh, workspace to do X, Y, Z. No, it's really about saying uh, what are the needs of our teams? And in this case, nurses specifically, what types of work do nurses need to do? How do our spaces help them? And just figure out which strengths you have right now that you can highlight, and then start to slowly identify some things that you might need to talk about changing over a certain amount of time. Team support is the next big bucket. Uh, obviously, a lot of organizations are working in teams, talking about teams, figuring out how teams can get better, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of work already going on here. And we know in general that when people feel like they're part of something larger, they tend to feel more satisfaction and, in general, more resilience to what's going on in their high-stress environments. You're likely doing a lot of this work as part of your clinical development, but I want you to just put your workforce glasses on for a minute and think about what burnout, resiliency, specific strategies you have or could have related to team roles, managers, and data. So for example, developing personalized burnout plans, just like you might have career development plans, can be a high impact but relatively affordable way to get your high functioning managers providing some burnout specific support. So a lot of this, just put on your burnout, put on your burnout glasses and think, okay, what's one, one thing we could add or one thing we could tweak to make this something that really helps people? We've talked a lot about this with our previous speakers, staff support, um, work-life balance, obviously. There are a lot of things that organizations can do in terms of their hours, in terms of their benefits structure, in terms of how they decide to staff up to make things like that work-life balance um, a little bit easier. Obviously, if you're doing shifts, and it depends on what type of setting you're in as a nurse, uh, but there are certain things that you want to be able to say, whatever your organization type, yes, we're working 
on creating structures and uh, hourly designs so that people can do what they need to do that's outside of this job. Uh, career develop is another career development is another way to focus on the job itself, and of course, really be talking about okay, you're here, you're working this job. We hope you love it. We hope you're great at it. Let's talk about what else will add to your personal satisfaction and make you feel engaged with the work that you're doing. Administrative processes. These are likely the ones you hear about most often that can feel kind of like the biggest bears to address sometimes. Uh, I could go on and on about this all day, and I'm sure you all could as experts uh, in your own organizations out there. Uh, but we really suggest you select a few things or even just one and put those workforce glasses back on to see how you can either manage, communicate, or change processes that are causing burnout. So a great example of this is the use of the electronic health record, which we all know can bring some challenges. So you could say, let's focus on um, how processes are really affecting us. Maybe there are documentation requirements and end user entry pieces we need to address. Maybe we could add regular optimi optimization meetings. Maybe we could designate some electronic health record catch-up time. Maybe we could have vendor scorecard metrics. There are a lot of smart people who already have these solutions and these strategies out there, and it's about saying, what are the ones that, that impact our team the most and our nurses? What's going to help them the most? And how do we actually build some of those strategies uh, into our processes? Okay, and the last one here is communication, which, you know, I think we all know these things, uh, but it's, a, it's difficult sometimes to make time for them. So we think actively putting this part in your plans is a great help. Of course, communication needs to be two-way, so making sure that uh, nurses and teams and other staff have opportunities to provide feedback kind of up and around the organization. Having that very positive culture, we heard about it uh, earlier when we were folks were talking about an unhealthy food culture, that's one element of culture, right? Other elements are talking about positivity. So doing things like adding weekly wins to regular team meetings or huddles is a great way to start to very slowly, very easily, and I'll mention again, it's a no-cost solution to start implementing and creating some of that positive, engaged, supportive culture you really want to do. A lot of it comes just down to clear expectations and mission alignment with what whatever type of organization you have and whatever type of team you have to really uh, give people the space and the structure to do what they need to do. So putting it all together here before we flip over to questions, you know, there's a lot that you can do in 10 minutes. We've covered five different buckets of activities and a few different ideas for strategies within those things. We had a lot of questions about, yes, but what now? Right? What types of solutions are the right fit for our organization? What specific things should we try? How do I know if one thing is making a difference? How does this all fit together? We don't know. Um, but we're extremely uh, happy to say that we do have a self-assessment tool that can get you started kind of right away. Um, and this was developed by Lisa Gray, who worked with our team. And she's also on the line. So if you have questions about this tool, she's, she can get with you in chat box too. Uh, but we created this burnout assessment tool. And it's really about assessing burnout from an organizational standpoint. It's just about seven questions, so it should only take you about 10 minutes to complete. It's not meant to be a burdensome, completely comprehensive, everything under the sun that will take you a year to work out kind of assessment. It's really about just saying, hey, from an organizational perspective, how can we create something uh, that's better for our teams, better for our nurses, better for all types of team members? So it's web-based. This is the, a screenshot of the first piece. It's going to ask you some questions, give you some pop-up resources, really help you start to identify strategies to improve retention and reduce burnout. And then you'll get a personalized report with some recommendations based on what you put in there. So we really encourage you uh, to connect with your teams after this. Sit down, take the 10 minutes, fill out that tool, and start to talk about what kind of plan your organization can put into place to help uh, individuals and nurses start uh, building that resilience and reducing that burnout. 
So my contact information here is here and in the slides that are available for download in the file section. And I'm going to say thank you and turn it back over to our organizers. Thank you very much. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take an opportunity to switch over. So there's a few poll questions that we're going to ask for our remaining participants. Uh, if you can fill these out. While you're filling these out and thinking of some questions that you'd like to ask the operator, operator, I'm going to ask that you go over the instructions on how those on the phone can queue up to ask a question. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please unmute your phone, press star 1, and record your name clearly when prompted so I may introduce you. If you wish to withdraw your question, you may press star 2. Again, to ask a question, press star 1. Thank you. And the other thing that I wanted to draw to everyone's attention, uh, there was some chat in the chat box regarding the uh, Dr. Ross's references that she had in her presentation. We wanted to let you know that the PDF of those references is available in the file share pod. And to download the file share, the, to download either the combined presentations and or Dr. Ross's references, you can do so by selecting each file, clicking the download files button and then you'll be able to save the files in the location of your choice. Um, with that being said, I think we have a few questions that have come in over the chat, but I'm going to ask the operator, are there any questions that have queued up over the phone? I show no questions over the phone at this time, but again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. Excellent. Uh, with that being said, I think we have a few questions over the chat. We're ready to ask our presenters. Great. So one of the questions that came in is um, a comment and a question. So they um, wanted to know um, if there is, which, sorry, <laughs> let me just read the question. Um, specifically, so the interesting point specifically on women who are taking care of their elderly parents and young kids, is there a large percentage of nurses doing this? And so that uh, came in during Dr. Ross's presentation. Um, yeah, this is um, this is Allison Ross. I, um, you know, this hasn't received very much um, research attention, and I think it's um, it's a really ripe area for research. This this um, thought of double duty and triple duty caregivers, and um, in our last study where we. Um, we, were, we surveyed the nurses at the NIH Clinical Center. There were about 1,300 nurses um, that we asked to participate. Maybe 350 ended up participating. They, um, in that population, I believe it was 50%, half of the nurses were a caregiver of some sort. The, the biggest bulk were, um, had children, dependent children living in the home, and that was like I, I don't want to, it's in the first paper, it's in the um, nurse management paper. I think it was 25% um, were, uh, oh, I'm trying to think. 50% were taking care of children at home. I think 25% had um, an elderly or sick family member. And I believe it was close to 15% were caring for both. So they were triple duty caregivers. Those are really high percentages. Um, and I'm not sure how that plays out nationally, because I, don't, I haven't seen that um, looked at in nurses. Great, thank you. And the next question is, um, is there any data on how social media, texting apps, or other technology is supporting more physical activity? And that also came in um, for you, Dr. Ross. Um, but panel, uh, presenters, please feel free to jump in if you're also aware of any um, research out there. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to hand this over to Jamie, too, because I think she might be better able to answer this. But I do want to say um, I don't think there is a lot. There's some um, on, um, I'm trying to think what I've seen in nurses. Not much with nurses. But when I attended the um, annual meeting for the Society of Behavioral Medicine, which is just a big um, multidisciplinary group that meets um, annually in America. And um, health promoting behaviors is just a huge um, point of research for this group. And there, there are lots of really great research studies that are using different types, different uses of social media and apps. Um, in order to increase health promoting behaviors in other populations. So I think there's a lot out there and this is really ripe for nursing. So I don't know if Jamie knows any more about that 
um, possibly? Uh, sure. So, so um, I know more of, you know, sort of from our initial planning of Healthy Nurse, Healthy Nation, when we were looking at effective strategies, um, and the technology, it, it can be useful, but like a lot of technology, maybe it's used for a while and then put in a drawer, especially with fitness trackers. And where they've been more effective is when they're part of other programs, right? So that, you know, a, a step challenge within an organization that might have some incentives. And I think what's at the bottom of this is um, finding ways for people to connect and get together and to have fun and to exercise. And so when included in, in sort of a more holistic approach like that, um, they tend to be more effective. Operator, are there any questions that have queued up over the phone? I show no questions over the phone. came in over the, um, the chat and it says, can you please provide a link to the burnout assessment tool? And Allison did provide that link um, as well as a link to the National Cooperative Agreement through CHC and ACU that we have. Um, the next one is, are there tools available to assess signs of burnout or work-related stress that are universal to healthcare providers? I'm specifically interested in resources for dental clinicians working in underserved communities. Thanks for the presentations and very helpful, very useful information. Uh, hi, this is Jamie. I, I saw that question in the chat. And I did look at the NAM Collaborative Clinician um, Wellbeing Resource Hub. So I have a link to that. It's actually called the Clinician Wellbeing Knowledge Hub. Um, and there are, there are resources in here that are specific to, to dental students and to, and to dentists. Um, so I would, I would take a look there. Um, and there are some, some burnout information too, and bur burnout resources specifically as well. This is Allison too. Oh, I just put a link uh, to what we call a burnout bundle on our SAR Center website. We have what's called bundles, which are collections of different types of resources on topics we get a lot of questions about. So we have a burnout bundle. Uh, it, the link is in the chat. The URL is chcworkforce.org slash burnout. It includes a number of articles, websites, multimedia tools, and archived webinars on burnout generally for providers and other types of staff uh, in under-resourced and underserved organizations. And so that included the, the NAM Action Collaborative on Clinician Wellbeing and Resilience. That link is there in case you couldn't get it on Jamie's slides quickly. And it's got a lot of different types of things. So we're happy to talk with you offline too. Remember, we have um, free technical assistance available for anybody who wants to do a little bit of a deeper dive on a specific topic that they're interested in in terms of burnout resources or developing that action plan I talked about. This is more of a comment. It says, Allison, thank you for acknowledging the importance of organizational and structural factors affecting nurse health and burnout. It's not all about self-care. We recognize how critical social determinants of health are for patients' health. We need to continue to highlight structural and upstream factors that affect nurses' health, safety, and resilience. The question comes from Amanda Campbell. Can anyone talk about flexible scheduling? Are there models, pros, and cons for staff and leadership? Um, this is Allison Ross. I, I, I want to say, um, I, sorry, I wanted to chime in about the burnout thing, and then I'll, then I'll address the question. Um, the burnout measures, if the person who was asking about burnout measures was inter interested in doing research related to burnout, I would say that the professional quality of life uh, questionnaire, it's called ProQual, is um, really well validated and reliable. And I've used it in now in two studies. Um, but it looks, it has three subscales, one for burnout, one for secondary traumatic stress, and the third for compassion satisfaction, which is how much we love our jobs, which actually is an important topic. Anyway, um, if, so if what you were interested in the burnout for was for um, actual research, I think you might look at that tool as well. And they, um, uh, that is for pro helping professions in general. So it's not specific to nurses, although it's been used in nursing. So it would also work for 
dentists and dental hygienists, whatever. Um, I'm sorry, so now I've lost, can you repeat the question that they, that they asked, um, the, the next question? Yes, the question was, um, does anyone, hold on, let me go back. Oh, it was about schedules. About flex scheduling, models, pros, cons for staff and leadership. Um, all I can say about this, this isn't really my area of expertise, but when I look at stress in the workplace um, with nurses, it is very clear that um, when you look at negative health outcomes for nurses, whether it's um, sleep disturbances or obesity, um, poor physical mental health, um, one thing, one workplace factor that just arises over and over are either long shifts, so those are shifts in excess of 10 to 12 hours, and also rotating shifts. So uh, rotating shifts is kind of the kiss of death to nurses' health um, for a variety of reasons. But the problem is, um, you know, rotating shifts are really valued by nurses. Uh, not rotating shifts, but I'm sorry, but 12-hour shifts. Um, they love it because they only work three days a week. Um, and the administrations love rotating shifts because it allows them to plug nurses in where they need them. Um, the, but, but the evidence is overwhelming that if you look at um, workplace factors that impact nurses' health, those two things are very bad for nurses. Um, and it's hard, it's hard to wean both the nurses and the administrators from those shifts um, and so my, I don't know anything about, um, about um, any sort of programs that have been designed or um, to kind of stop these or um, because they're just so popular on both, it, on both sides. Okay, the next question is, have there been any studies of a group of nurses who were able to successfully turn around their work environment, lower their BMI, better their stress levels, et cetera? Um, okay, this is Hi. Allison. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'll let somebody else chime in. Oh, Allison, you go first, and then I'll follow. This is Jamie. You go first. Um, well, I was going to say this. Um, there aren't there really isn't a lot, there aren't a lot of intervention studies out there that I know of, Jamie might know more, probably does know more than I do, about changing the culture. Um, now, and that's my area of interest is research. I think there's probably a lot out there in the administrative journals um, about like workplace initiatives and maybe quality improvement initiatives, and that wouldn't be, I just wouldn't, those don't across, come across my radar. So Jamie, you would know this probably better than I do. Well, and, and through Healthy Nurse Healthy Nation, again, you know, really focused on, on sort of that, that um, organization employer model where we're working with organizations to, to make commitments towards improving health and we're asking organizations to share uh, some things that they've done. So while it's not necessarily research studies we're highlighting, uh, we post weekly uh, blogs that highlight examples from organizations where we ask them to share data. Uh, for instance, we just posted a recent one um, where one of our partners shared that they are, they did a sleep challenge and during the sleep challenge they were able to uh, increase sleep hours by, of their employees by 77.3% and they talked about how they did that. And again, that's just an example, but what we want to do more and more um, is share, share these exemplars with our community. And then as uh, we continue to gather data through the Healthy Nurse Survey, uh, I mentioned that we would be resetting our survey, which would allow us to compare data um, between the times that, that people take take the survey, and that will allow us to really look at um, how, how we are able to impact the health, wellness, and safety of nurses through, through what we're doing here. The next question is, do any of the speakers have an experience or data on the success of meditation to deal with stress? Um, okay, I'll, this is Allison Ross again. I'll chime in. Um, yes, there have been, uh, I don't want to say several, but I would say a couple of studies. There's a lot of evidence that shows that meditation reduces stress, um, both 
perceived stress and the physiology associated with stress. In other words, it lowers blood pressure, it reduces cortisol levels. There's lots of good evidence that it works. Um, there is some evidence in nursing. Um, I have it somewhere. It's not probably not in my papers. But I do want to say that when we think about health-promoting behaviors in nurses or in anyone, we almost always think about um, exercise and diet. But really, stress reduction activities, things like meditation, yoga, um, spending time in nature, um, and social support, those are two others, and I'd say add spirituality possibly as a third, are three other behaviors that I really do consider health-promoting behaviors that just don't get as much attention. And I think they're every bit as important to resilience in nursing. Thank you. The next question is, what ideas are out there for reducing the stigma around providers slash nursing practicing self-care at work, such as taking a walk? Hi, this is Jamie, and I think a lot of this really does come from uh, leadership support, too, uh, particularly related to those, those breath breaks. And we're seeing almost half of nurses saying that they have to come early, stay late, work through their, their rest breaks. And so um, leadership support and making sure that nurses are supported in taking those breaks and, and, and that um, when they take breaks that they can feel comfortable that, you know, they'll be covered. Uh, I think that will go a long way um, culturally towards, towards supporting that. Um, this is Allison and I, Ross, and I want to chime in on that, too. I think that um, the leaders within the organization, including managers at all levels, can model self-care because they can say, you have my permission to go take your lunch break off the unit or take a walk or whatever, but then when they work, you know, weekends and nights and return emails when they're on vacation and, you know, work through lunch every day, they're kind of really role modeling a whole different thing. So I'd say that matters. Um, and the other point I wanted to make is that I really believe that the culture change, that there are things that can be done on the unit to change the culture too. Um, and that's that if you, can, if you can target the key players, people who have um, the informal power on the unit, I think you have a real opportunity to change culture as well. Um, this is Allison Avisegra, and I will just add uh, to that, which is, yeah, there's a lot that can be done, too, on sort of process and workflows that allow people to take a step back uh, from what they're doing. There's the big first piece, which was, you know, cultural change, language, uh, focusing on how self-care is really team care is really patient care. There's a lot of work that can be done there, but people need systems and structures in place in order to make that a reality. And so it, it can depend a lot on um, how do teams, for example, prepare for patients? Um, do they have charts that get real-time information? Can they check systems there so if they stepped away, they didn't have to worry about missing someone for a crucial conversation to help them get back into things when they get back? Uh, it can, there's a lot that you can do with how you structure people's workflows, how they get information, how they can quickly catch back up to information when they get back that can really supplement and provide space for all that cultural change that we've been talking about. Um, this is Allison Ross. I want to chime in, too, that I'm glad Allison, too, said that. Um, because a week or two ago, I got an email from a nurse on one of the units at the NIH who asked me if I could come and speak to them on time management, which I thought was interesting because it's not my area of expertise. But her point was she felt like the reason they weren't getting breaks wasn't that they weren't supported and it wasn't that they just couldn't do it. It's that they weren't, she felt like they weren't managing their time well, which I thought was really interesting because I'd never really thought about that. I thought, oh, maybe if we reduce the workload, nurses will have then time to go off the unit. But um, so there actually is a whole, a whole um, arena of research on that looks at nursing workflow, which is fascinating to me, and where nurses spend their time. 
And so I got to thinking about that and thinking, wow, that really is an area that maybe we need to look at for how we, we can restructure their time and how they make decisions about how they use their time so that they could get control of their schedules and being able to take breaks off the unit and um, meals. But I thought it was interesting. Thank you. And as we sit here, um, you know, in the room, we were having a discussion because, you know, we're BHW and we do a lot of focusing on interprofessional collaborative practice and working in teams and, and our um, care models and care coordination in terms of teams. Have any of you looked at um, this? I know this is for Nurses Weekend. We're focusing on nursing, but looking at this from um, an interprofessional lens and how we could somehow make a bigger impact. I mean, we're all aiming towards achieving the quadruple aim at this point, um, but has, have you looked at it either from, you know, an organizational standpoint at ANA or um, at STAR2 or even at the NIH, um, what larger impact we can have um, by using that interprofessional lens? We're doing right now, this is Allison from ECU, we're doing right now kind of research, study, investigation uh, into actually kind of unintended consequences on personal resilience and burnout of team-based care models. So a great example is um, family physicians who've come to me and said, hey, you know, I used to do a lot of variety of things, and now that we have this specific kind of team-based model where I'm, quote, unquote, working to the top of my license every day, I really get no psychic breaks with patients. It's always the most critical patients with the most complex problems, and I don't get to do um, just a regular check-in with a patient I've had for a long time, and, and it's really impacting my ability to get through every day. And that's an example for a physician, but there's lots of different kinds of team members, including nurses, who are having similar situations where the work of their day has really changed depending on their specific team-based care model. Uh, and that's really impacting their general enjoyment of their work and the crisis uh, in terms of burden that they feel working every day. So I think we're approaching it from that way moving forward and trying to help to understand how organizations uh, should or could be managing processes so that they have these moments to check in, collect data from staff and team members about um, sort of these elements that really impact burnout. And, and this is Jamie from ANA. Yes, so this is definitely something we're focused on, on too. As I mentioned, we're part of the, the, the NAM collaborative that, that focuses on clinician well-being, and that's definitely multidisciplinary. And um, Healthy Nurse Healthy Nation is, is used by a lot of our organizational partners for all of their staff. And so, uh, of course, it's called Healthy Nurse Healthy Nation, and that's really um, more because we're recognizing and celebrating the importance, importance of the role of, nurse, of nurses in this issue. Uh, but we do have uh, about 20% of those who have joined are, are not are not nurses. Uh, we have um, physical therapists, occupational therapists, dietitians. We have um, physicians, um, a lot of nursing assistants. So that's definitely the direction that we're heading. Thank you very much. Do we have any further questions? Operator, anyone on the phone line waiting to ask a question? I show no questions at this time, but as a last reminder, you can press star 1 to ask a question. And this is Allison Abisekra. I just wanted to add while we're waiting for one more question. Uh, I see a question in one of the polls that somebody asked about um, info on kind of the impact, cost, success rate of organizations that have committed to supporting employees and improved health. And we don't have that specific calculator, but I am going to just drop in the chat box in a minute a link to our financial impact tool. We're big believers in having a data-informed workforce plan, so hopefully your organizations are collecting, thinking about, analyzing some HR metrics, some organizational metrics, some community metrics. Um, and our financial impact calculator essentially 
helps your organization calculate, calculate the specific cost of turnover for um, different types of staff members. You have to fill it out with them in mind, but um, different types of staff members. And you can usually connect that number there with some engagement or burnout data that you have over in column B and basically say, hey, if we think we're losing this amount of people to burnout and it costs us this much money, then could we take some of that money and invest it into burnout initiatives here? And so it's a little bit of a using different types of workforce data metrics to address um, the question of how are you actually going to invest in burnout initiatives and reconfiguring some of your organizational structures. So I'll drop that link in the chat box. Okay, I don't think we have any further questions. Um, this is the contact information for Leslie and I. Um, if you have any questions um, about our presenters, about our presentation, um, just send us an email. Um, we, like I said, we can be reached at these uh, email addresses. And I just wanted to just say thank you all for your time and attending this webinar uh, in celebration of National Nurses Week. I would also like to take the time to thank um, the leadership in the Division of Nursing and Public Health as well as all of our colleagues that have been supportive of us, um, especially um, our team in external affairs. So thank you all very much for making this a success. And again, if you have any questions about anything that you heard today, please feel free to email Leslie or I. Um, the link will be uh, forwarded to all of you that registered for the webinar. Um, once it's available, and then we will also be posting this webinar on our website, so you will have access to it there as well. So thank you again, um, and enjoy the rest of your day. And this concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating.